Manuel Conde, the man, the myth, the legend. What can he do? He can direct, produce, write, act, choreograph, shoot, punch. Oh, and did I mention he's a ventriloquist and has a wooden stooge named Kiko Tolosa he would always bring with him? Oh yeah, he can also dance, ride a horse, be held captive for days, and you know, he's pretty good at making films. Kidlet Tahimik once said that Conde was the grandfather of Philippine independent filmmaking since he was known for his self-produced low-budget films, unique resourcefulness, and vivid personality. Without a doubt, Conde has left his mark as one of the country's greatest filmmakers. So, who is he? And what was his role in the so-called first Philippine golden age of cinema? In this video, I'll talk about Conde's career starting in his early years in the 40s, his costume epics, the international fame of Genghis Khan, his political satires in the late 50s, and some fun trivia along the way. Manuel Conde, or Manuel Pabustan Urbano, was born in Diet Camarines Norte in October of 1915. Camarines Norte is known for its popular world-renowned surfing spots and breeding some of the most iconic local artists such as Fernando Omar Solo, Sir Ricky Lee, and of course Conde himself. His first breakout success in what would later on define his late 40s career would be in the adaptation of the famous Philippine corridor or magical romance Ibong Adarna in 1941 an LVN picture starring Esther Magalona, Fred Cortes, and Mila del Sol. Set in the mythical kingdom of Burbania, a king is mortally ill, and only the singing of a magical bird, the Ibong Adarna, can save his life. His three sons, Princess Pedro, Diego, and Juan, set out to search for the magical bird. However, its singing could put a man to sleep, since as it excretes waste, yes that means poop, it can turn any man into stone. There are also some princesses and another kingdom under the well, but that's besides the point. This story was one of the most popular Filipino costume epics at the time, even going as far back as the Spanish era. Conde's film was one of its most commercially successful adaptations. Well, that is, I would assume, before Ang TV's own Ibong Adarna movie. Hi, Jelena. This film marked many firsts. The first ever color movie in Philippine film history, courtesy of Ramon Manroy's meticulous frame-by-frame -frame hand painting of the titular bird. It is also the first film to earn 1 million pesos at the box office. The first film to use matte shots and background projections without synchronous motors. But more crucially, maybe because of some splendid act of God, Ibong Adarna is one of five pre-World War II films that have survived to the present. Thankfully, the ABS-CBN restoration project has digitally restored this film in 2020. It is one of the oldest films they've worked on. After the success of Ibong Adarna and his other films, something happened that would force Conde and his fellow filmmakers into seclusion. The pivotal moment in this time frame was when Conde met soon-to-be national artist Carlos Botong Francisco. The two would become great friends and occasionally talk about history and old classic myths and folklore. Botong Francisco is known for some of the most iconic artworks in the country, such as the Filipino struggles through history, Bayanian Sabukid, and 500 years of Philippine history. Conde didn't know it yet, but he had found a world-class visual artist to become his own loyal costume and set designer. Conde was able to make Hollywood-level costume epics with such small budgets due to the ingenious work of Botong Francisco, who designed all of the costumes, production sets, and backdrops, as well as a loving wife in Julita Urbano, who would personally sew all of his garments for him in their simple Sampaloc Manila household. Conde has starred directed, and produced numerous fantasy and medieval costume epic productions by the turn of the 1950s. However, he was yet to create his biggest hit, one that would catapult Conde and the Philippine movie industry along with him into international fame for the first time ever. Genghis Khan was released in 1950, with Manuel Conde starring as the eponymous character. Both Conde and Botong were drawn to the scrappy Mongolian warrior story about conquering vast lands just because he could. Conde, in particular, expressed his admiration for Temujin, Genghis Khan's original name, because of his guts in subduing leaders of other tribes, building a formidable army, 
and becoming the master of a sprawling empire. Connie was right to be drawn to the larger-than-life historical figure. Both figures had similarities that were instantly apparent in the film's production. Conda fashioned himself as an ordinary Filipino director from the humble country of the Philippines, but sought to conquer a film so colossal in its scope and so foreign from modern traditions that even Cecil B. DeMille, known for his big Hollywood epics, didn't attempt to do Genghis Khan. The film's plot is about the transformation of Temujin into the famed ruler of the world. After becoming the champion in a competition to decide which tribe will own the pasture lands, Temujin is faced with vitriolic opposition from Bircho's tribe, who massacres his village, including his father. This enrages Temujin, who is told by his mother to take on the name of King Without Peer, or more known as Genghis Khan. The rest of the film is a combination of astonishing battles and carefully choreographed horseback fights. To further save money, Khan's resourcefulness took center stage. He offered his services as a director, star, writer, janitor, and messenger, all for free while shooting on the hills of Angona Rizal. To make up for the lack of clag lights on set, he compensated by using the headlights of trucks, jeeps, and other motor vehicles. He also didn't have dollies, so he placed both cameraman and camera on a wheelbarrow, which would be pushed and pulled for both close-ups and full shots. When the local premiere came, it was marketed as the first Filipino film to be shown at the newly minted Times Theatre in Capo. However, it wasn't a hit there. Despite this unfortunate showing, Conde won big as the most popular director in the Philippine movie popularity poll, which gave him a ticket to the US to observe the latest techniques in acting, directing, and production. Of course, he brought some of his films for the trip. Among them was his recently ridiculed film, Genghis Khan. The year is 1951, at a small Hollywood screening. Audiences which consisted of studio execs, actors, and writers were shown the infamous Genghis Khan. They were impressed, noting its outstanding production design by Botong Francisco and the surprisingly authentic species of horses that were once mocked. Apparently, the tiny horses used for the film were accurate to the Genghis Khan period and have since gone extinct in Europe and America. Of course, Conde, who was initially distraught by the local response to the film, found this as an opportunity for showmanship. He said, As a matter of fact, my production was delayed by six months because we had to look for those horses in the wilds of Luzon to make the film look authentic. What a guy. Then came James Agee, the famed American writer fresh off writing the film African Queen, and he would be critical in Conde's journey to international recognition. Agee reportedly saw the film and was quoted saying, Good lord, it's a masterpiece. Then, like a sea parting towards the promised land, Conde was on his way to the Venice Film Festival. Genghis Khan's showing in Venice would mark the first time a Filipino film set its foot on the prestigious Worldwide Film Festival. It would stand side by side with films such as Forbidden Games by René Clamont and Europe 51 by Roberto Rossellini. On the day of the festival itself, Conde wore a traditional Barong Tagalog, the Philippine national costume, and was introduced as the producer, director, actor of Genghis Khan. Indeed not a small feat when compared to other filmmakers. He was known as the best director of the Philippines throughout the festival. After Genghis Khan was shown, it quickly became one of the most popular films at the festival. It was praised for its production design, editing, music, cinematography, and action. There was also equal praise for the zeal shown in Khan's acting and direction. A Time magazine critic pointed out the film's similarities with the Western. Manuel Conde plays the part of Genghis Khan as a rather handsome, ferocious, cunning, but likable fellow 
a sort of medieval Shane roaming the Gobi Desert. An Italian film publication sang its praise for Conda's direction and points out similarities with director Sergei Eisenstein. There is no doubt that among the Russian directors of the classical period, it is Eisenstein that has had a direct influence in Conde. It is shown in figurative composition of the framing and rhythm of the edit. One particularly infuriating thing which other critics were also quick to point out was the unnecessary and distracting English narration brought to you by James A.G. himself. A critic from Variety lambasted the narration, saying that the narration by James A.G. is too simple and didactic for the pick and gives it a storybook flavor bellied by its mayhem. Harrison's reports noted in the 1953 theatrical release that American audiences will find the picture quite confusing for it has English narration superimposed over the Tagalog dialogue spoken by the players. Something about the narration made the film feel like it was an art house documentary about native tribes. It sucks that we still get to faintly hear the original Filipino dialogue because we got a glimpse of what could have been. This day, it is the only remaining copy of Genghis Khan that exists. When Conde came back to the country, locals embraced him like a hero. The same people who scorned Genghis Khan had finally changed their tune, especially when that film became the golden ticket for the country's international fame. Almost 70 years later, John Ercilia would win the Best Actor Volpe Cup in the 78th Venice Film Festival. To think that the Philippines has been there since the 13th Venice Film Festival is such an awe-inspiring facet of history. So what is Conde's legacy in Philippine cinema? When you think about the Golden Age, the mind immediately rushes towards the second one with Broca and Brunel. But here we have a director who undoubtedly helped pave the way for these directors, and his most prominent known footnote seems to just be Genghis Khan. A common theme that I want to highlight about Conde's legacy was how he embodied the distinct Filipino spirit in his filmmaking. One of the best indicators of Conde's unparalleled nationalism was in 1959, when Conde revisited the trickster Wantamad, but this time with a twist. The film would be called Wantamad Goes to Congress and dealt with contemporary social and political issues set in a pre colonial setting. Conde wanted to target the hypocrisies and impropriety of the politicians at the time. It was an open secret that leaders in the Philippines would use their positions to enrich themselves and avoid getting criminally charged. A phenomenon that still sounds quite relevant today. Conde was well aware of this and aimed at making general audiences lower their guards by showing clear parallels to real-life political corruption through exaggeration and satire. Unfortunately, this film and along with the other Wantamad films are lost. Especially the gentlemen from 15 to 60, preferably those with red Cadillac convertibles. My home address is 79 Makili Street, Kubau, Quezon City. My home address is 79 Makili Street, Kubau, Quezon City. My telephone number is 72020. My telephone number. Is 7 20 20. Any day, any hour, any time. Conde died in 1986, but his legacy seeped into the genes of Philippine cinema. He put the country on the world stage, and it seemed like everybody took notice except for the government at the time. Before Conde died, he did not get a word of encouragement in writing or verbally from his administration. For all of its global magnitude, Genghis Khan was always described as a profoundly Filipino film by Conde, despite not receiving a single centavo from the Philippine government. He wore the Barong Tagalog in Venice and introduced his cultural heritage. He promoted the beauty of the Philippine landscape and even highlighted the country's pre-colonial era. He admired the Hispanic traditions and customs of the Philippines and found ways to let audiences engage with them. He was resourceful, always finding ways to make big costume epics despite budgetary constraints, and didn't care for the modest expectations set for the film industry of a third world country. He spoke of always wanting to make socially relevant films about mining, 
fishing, legal logging, and natural resources. He even influenced people to vote wisely in the 1960s when a wave of independent candidates who were honest and hardworking won the local elections after Juan Tamad's release. Unfortunately, he could not bear what was happening to the industry in the 70s when the bomba films arrived and filmmakers shot quicker, often without scripts and done in such a short length of time. Honda's way of filmmaking didn't fit with the times any longer. He realized that his concept of a good picture was one that emanated from one capable central mind, which has escaped the disgusting experience of undergoing assembly line methods, and which, when finished, is not only seen, but felt by the artist as a true piece of creation. Despite the storied career of Manuel Conde, out of his 40 total films, only 8 of them are known to still exist today. The rest of them have either been lost or burned due to unfortunate fires that plagued movie studios back then. Seven of them are available online from a pool of sources, ranging from Mike DeLeon's collection on Vimeo, Simon Santos's Video 48 Rentals, and the Film Development Council of the Philippines and ABS-CBN Restoration Catalog. For more information about where you can find these films and the resources we use to make this video, check out the links below. <laughs>